It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. William Lane Craig. Probably doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, but we're thrilled to have him on our team at Biola. He's a, uh, in my view, he's a distinguished research professor of philosophy at the Talbot School of Theology at Biola University and at uh, HBU. Uh, he's written, likewise, a shelf full of books, and he takes on some of the most difficult topics a person can, can handle. Uh, arguments for God's existence, the nature of time, uh, arguments about divine foreknowledge and abstract objects, and just recently he took on the atonement. Uh, but he's known around the world for decades on his arguments for God's existence. And so to have him teach on that topic for us is really uh, something to behold, especially if you've never heard it before. Uh, he's also the founder of Reasonable Faith, which is a wonderful global ministry that, that answers questions at the very highest levels. And please do visit the Reasonable Faith table and enjoy the lecture by Dr. William Lane Craig. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. In our increasingly aggressive secular society, it is vitally important that Christians be able to defend their belief in God. As a professional philosopher, I'm persuaded that the hypothesis that God exists makes sense of a wide range of the data of human experience. And tonight I want to share with you some of these data. Now, in order to make these arguments easy to understand, I'm going to be showing some animated videos that we've developed at Reasonable Faith and which are available online at reasonablefaith.org. And I'm hopeful that if time permits, we'll have opportunity to ask questions uh, after my presentation using the floor mics that have been set up for that purpose. One of the biggest obstacles to belief in God today is apathy. People are just too busy or too unconcerned to be bothered about looking into the evidence that God exists. Part of the antidote for such indifference is to awaken people to just what's at stake in the question of God's existence. Far from being a trivial matter, the question of God's existence is the most important question that a human being can ask. Here, the works of atheist philosophers themselves can be of great help. Atheist philosophers like Friedrich Nietzsche, Bertrand Russell, and Jean-Paul Sartre have argued that if God does not exist, then human life is ultimately absurd. The absurdity of life involves three elements, meaning, value, and purpose. These three notions, meaning, value, and purpose, though closely related, are conceptually distinct. Meaning has to do with something's importance, why it matters. Value has to do with something's moral worth. It's being good or bad, right or wrong. Purpose has to do with a goal, a reason for something. And if there is no God, then according to these atheist thinkers, life is ultimately without meaning, value, or purpose. Now, it's important to understand the argument here. The claim is not that atheists live boring and dull lives, or have no personal values, or have no goals in life. Rather, the claim is that if there is no God, then meaning, value, and purpose are just human illusions, having no objectivity. For without God, there is no absolute standard of right and wrong, and everything is doomed to destruction in the heat death of the universe, no matter what we do. The following video helps to explain the human predicament in the absence of God. Let's look at it together. You know, nobody asked me if I wanted to exist. Yeah, one day, boom, 
there you are. And you think to yourself, why am I here? Well, what do you think? Is there a reason we're here? Do our lives have any real significance? Well, that depends. On what? On whether or not God exists. Wait, hold on. Are you saying that my life has no significance because I don't believe in God? No, not at all. I'm saying that if God doesn't exist, it doesn't matter what you believe. Our lives would have no objective meaning, value or purpose. Many atheists themselves recognize this. If atheism is true, life is absurd. Okay, and why do they think that? To begin with, if God does not exist, then the physical universe is all there is. Which means you and I are just accidental byproducts of nature. Right. So? That means we were not intentionally designed. So there's no purpose for us being here. Whoa. It gets worse. If God does not exist, there is no absolute standard of moral value. You've heard of Richard Dawkins, the atheist. He points out that in a materialistic universe, there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pointless indifference. So you're saying atheists can't be good people? No, I'm not saying that. Many atheists live good lives. What I'm saying is, atheism fails to provide an objective basis for saying any particular action is good or evil. Oh, come on. After millions of years of sociobiological evolution, humans have developed a sense of morality. We all know it's good to feed a hungry child and bad to torture someone for fun. Of course we do. But that's precisely what atheism cannot explain. If there's no God, then what we consider right or wrong is nothing more than an accident of evolution or a human social convention. So what? I'm good with that. Really? Evolution implies survival of the fittest, not morality. And social convention means that racism, intolerance and cruelty are not really wrong. They just happen to be unpopular. Okay, so atheists need to come up with some objective standard for rights and wrongs. How about this? If an action leads to human flourishing, then we can say it's objectively good. And if it doesn't, it's objectively evil. But why think that human flourishing is good? Aren't you being species-centric? Why not refer instead to the flourishing of rats or cabbages? Well, uh... And who gets to decide what contributes to human flourishing? Hitler was convinced killing millions of Jews would promote human flourishing. And Margaret Sanger thought forcing poor people to be sterilized would lead to human flourishing. As Guy Nielsen points out, pure practical reason will not take you to morality. So if atheism is true, there is no legitimate basis for saying that behaving one way is worse than behaving any other way. So it really doesn't matter how you live your life. Your day-to-day -day choices are meaningless. That's depressing. So if there's no God, what happens when you die? Well, nothing. You simply cease to exist. Right. So one person lives a kind, generous, thoughtful life. Another lives a horrible, violent, selfish life. It doesn't matter. In both cases, the outcome is the same. Nothingness. So how can their life choices have any objective meaning? Well, it's certainly meaningful if I discover a cure for cancer or save a child's life. I agree completely. But atheism can't explain why. Scientists predict that eventually the whole universe and mankind with it will die out. So everything comes to nothing. That's why atheist Bertrand Russell says we must build our lives on the firm foundation of despair. No thanks. I'd rather live a happy life. You're not alone. Every atheist has to choose between being happy or being consistent. You can tell the whole world you're an atheist, but you can't really live like one. Okay, so you're a Christian. If your God did exist, how would that change anything? If Christianity is true, then each one of us is here for a reason. And life does not end at the grave. And God, he's the absolute standard of goodness. He knows you, he loves you, and he intentionally created you. So your life ultimately does have objective meaning, value, and purpose. 
That means you can live a life that's both happy and consistent. Well, that doesn't prove Christianity is true. Agreed. I'm simply pointing out that for Christians, living a life that is both happy and consistent is possible. For atheists, it's not. So what are you going to choose? Given the absurdity of life and the unlivability of atheism, it's imperative, I think, that we retrace our steps and ask anew whether God exists. I want to share with you now three arguments for God's existence which I think make it probable that God does indeed exist. Number one, God makes sense of the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Typically, atheists have said that the universe is just eternal, and that's all. But is that true? The next video explains how the scientific evidence for the origin of the universe points beyond the universe to its personal creator. Does God exist? Or is the material universe all that is, or ever was, or ever will be? One approach to answering this question is the cosmological argument. It goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Is the first premise true? Let's consider. Believing that something can pop into existence without a cause is more of a stretch than believing in magic. At least with magic you've got a hat and a magician. And if something can come into being from nothing, then why don't we see this happening all the time? No, everyday experience and scientific evidence confirm our first premise. If something begins to exist, it must have a cause. But what about our second premise? Did the universe begin, or has it always existed? Atheists have typically said that the universe has been here forever. The universe is just there, and that's all. First, let's consider the second law of thermodynamics. It tells us the universe is slowly running out of usable energy, and that's the point. If the universe had been here forever, it would have run out of usable energy by now. The second law points us to a universe that has a definite beginning. This is further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. This allowed us, for the first time, to talk meaningfully about the past history of the universe. Next, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, each working with Einstein's equations, predicted that the universe is expanding. Then in 1929, Edwin Hubble measured the red shift in light from distant galaxies. This empirical evidence confirmed not only that the universe is expanding, but that it sprang into being from a single point in the finite past. It was a monumental discovery, almost beyond comprehension. However, not everyone is fond of a finite universe, so it wasn't long before alternative models popped into existence. But one by one, these models failed to stand the test of time. More recently, three leading cosmologists, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth and Alexander Vilenkin, prove that any universe which has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. This even applies to the multiverse, if there is such a thing. This means that scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Any adequate model must have a beginning, just like the standard model. 
It's quite plausible then that both premises of the argument are true. This means that the conclusion is also true. The universe has a cause. And since the universe can't cause itself, its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused and unimaginably powerful. Much like God. The cosmological argument shows that, in fact, it is quite reasonable to believe that God does exist. Here once more are the three simple premises of this argument. One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. One of the most startling developments of modern science is that we now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning about 14 billion years ago in a cataclysmic event known as the Big Bang. As explained in the video, in 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe which has on average been in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past, but must have a beginning. And that applies to multiverse scenarios too. In 2012, Vilenkin showed that models which do not meet this one condition still fail for other reasons to avert the beginning of the universe. Vilenkin concluded, and I quote, none of these scenarios can actually be past eternal. All the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning, end quote. In the fall of 2015, Vilenkin strengthened that conclusion. He wrote, we have no viable models of an eternal universe. The bord guth vilenkin theorem gives reason to believe that such models simply cannot be constructed. The bord guth vilenkin theorem proves that classical space-time under a single very general condition cannot be extended to past infinity, but must reach a boundary at some point in the finite past. Now, either there was something on the other side of that boundary or not. If not, then that boundary just is the beginning of the universe. If there was something on the other side, then it will be a region described by the yet to be discovered theory of quantum gravity, in which case, Vilenkin says, it will be the beginning of the universe. Either way, the universe began to exist. Now, the video describes scientific evidence for the universe's beginning. But in my published work, I also lay out philosophical reasons for thinking that the universe began to exist. Just think about it for a minute. If the universe never began to exist, then the number of events in the history of the universe is infinite. But how could an infinite number of past events elapse one after another in order for today to arrive? That would be like trying to count down all of the negative numbers ending at zero. That seems like an absurd task. For before you could count any number, you would already have to have counted an infinite number of prior numbers. And if you could count down from infinity, why did you finish only today? Why not yesterday or the day before? At any point in the infinite past, you've already had an infinite amount of time to finish your countdown, and therefore you should already be done. These sorts of absurdities suggest that an actually infinite past is impossible. 
since something cannot come from nothing, the absolute beginning of the universe implies the existence of a beginningless, uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, enormously powerful, personal creator of the universe. Reason number two, God makes sense of the fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the existence of intelligent life depends upon a complex and delicate balance of initial conditions simply given in the Big Bang itself. Scientists once believed that whatever the initial conditions of the universe might have been, eventually intelligent life might evolve somewhere. But we now know that our existence is balanced on a razor's edge. The existence of intelligent life anywhere in the cosmos depends upon a conspiracy of initial conditions which must be fine-tuned to a degree that is literally incomprehensible and incalculable. The following video explains how this remarkable fine-tuning points to an intelligent designer of the universe. From galaxies and stars, down to atoms and subatomic particles. The very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body, or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant. A change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would again be life prohibiting. Or another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these and many other numbers have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. What is the best explanation for this astounding phenomenon? There are three live options. The fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Which of these options is the most plausible? According to this alternative, 
the universe must be life permitting. The precise values of these constants and quantities could not be otherwise. But is this plausible? Is a life prohibiting universe impossible? Far from it. It's not only possible, it's far more likely than a life permitting universe. The constants and quantities are not determined by the laws of nature. There's no reason or evidence suggests that fine tuning is necessary. How about chance? Did we just get really, 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 really lucky? No. The probabilities involved are so ridiculously remote as to put the fine tuning well beyond the reach of chance. So in an effort to keep this option alive, some have gone beyond empirical science and opted for a more speculative approach known as the multiverse. They imagine a universe generator that cranks out such a vast number of universes that, odds are, life-permitting universes will eventually pop out. However, there's no scientific evidence for the existence of this multiverse. It cannot be detected, observed, measured, or proved. And the universe generator itself would require an enormous amount of fine-tuning. Furthermore, small patches of order are far more probable than big ones. So the most probable observable universe would be a small one inhabited by a single, simple observer. But what we actually observe is the very thing that we should least expect, a vast, spectacularly complex, highly ordered universe inhabited by billions of other observers. So even if the multiverse existed, which is a moot point, it wouldn't do anything to explain the fine tuning. Given the implausibility of physical necessity or chance, the best explanation for why the universe is fine-tuned for life may very well be, it was designed that way. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect monkeyed with physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. There is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. The examples of fine tuning mentioned in the video are all up to date, accurate, and well established. It's important to keep in mind that the term fine tuned does not mean designed. The expression is a neutral term, which just means that the range of life permitting values for the fundamental constants and quantities is extraordinarily narrow. If the value of even one of these constants or quantities were to be altered by less than a hair's breadth, the delicate balance required for the existence of life would be upset and the universe would be life prohibiting instead. Fine tuning in this neutral sense is well established. The question we face then is this, what is the best explanation of this remarkable fine tuning? There are three live options in the contemporary literature on fine tuning. Physical necessity, chance, or design. So the argument may be formulated in three simple steps. One, the fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Two, it is not due to physical necessity or chance, Three, therefore, it is due to design. As the video explains, the only serious alternative to design is the multiverse chance hypothesis. There are multiple problems with this hypothesis, 
But let me just highlight one of the most important. If our universe were just a random member of a multiverse, then we ought to be observing a much different universe than we do. Roger Penrose of Oxford University has pressed this objection forcefully. He points out that the odds of our universe's initial low entropy conditions obtaining by chance alone are on the order of one chance out of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. By contrast, the odds of our solar systems forming by a random collision of particles is one chance out of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 60. This number, says Penrose, is utter chicken feed in comparison to one out of 10 to the 10 to the 123rd. What that means is that it is incomprehensibly more likely that we should be observing an orderly patch no larger than our solar system, since a universe like that is so unfathomably more probable than a fine-tuned universe like ours. In fact, the most probable observable universe is one which consists of a single brain which pops into existence by a random fluctuation with illusory perceptions of an external world. So if you accept the multiverse explanation, you're obligated to believe that you are all that exists and that this auditorium your body, the earth, and everything that you perceive in the world are just illusions of your brain. No sane person believes such a thing. On atheism, therefore, it is highly improbable that there exists a randomly ordered multiverse. Ironically, the best hope for the multiverse hypothesis is to maintain that God created it and ordered its worlds so that they are not randomly ordered. God could give preference to observable worlds which are cosmically fine-tuned. Thus, to be rationally acceptable, the multiverse hypothesis actually needs God. With the failure of the multiverse hypothesis, the alternative of chance collapses. Neither physical necessity nor chance provides a good explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe. It therefore follows that the best explanation is design. Number three, God makes sense of objective moral values and duties in the world. The following video makes this argument very clear. Can you be good without God? Let's find out. Absolutely astounding. There you have it. Undeniable proof that you can be good without believing in God. But wait. The question isn't, can you be good without believing in God? The question is, can you be good without God? See, here's the problem. If there is no God, what basis remains for objective good or bad, right or wrong? If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. And here's why. Without some objective reference point, we have no way of saying that something is really up or down. God's nature provides an objective reference point for moral values. It's the standard against which all actions and decisions are measured. But if there's no God, there's no objective reference point. All we are left with is one person's viewpoint, which is no more valid than anyone else's viewpoint. This kind of morality is subjective, not objective. It's like a preference for strawberry ice cream. The preference is in the subject, not the object. So it doesn't apply to other people. In the same way, subjective morality applies only to the subject. It's not valid or binding for anyone else. So, in a world without God, there can be no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. 
God has expressed His moral nature to us as commands. These provide the basis for moral duties. For example, God's essential attribute of love is expressed in His command to love your neighbor as yourself. This command provides a foundation upon which we can affirm the objective goodness of generosity, self-sacrifice, and equality. And we can condemn as objectively evil greed, abuse, and discrimination. This raises a problem. Is something good just because God wills it, or does God will something because it is good? The answer is neither one. Rather, God wills something because He is good. God is the standard of moral values, just as a live musical performance is the standard for a high-fidelity recording. Without your love. The more a recording sounds like the original, the better it is. Likewise, the more closely a moral action conforms to God's nature, the better it is. But if atheism is true, there is no ultimate standard. So there can be no moral obligations or duties. Who or what lays such duties upon us? No one. Remember, for the atheist, humans are just accidents of nature, highly evolved animals. But animals have no moral obligations to one another. When a cat kills a mouse, it hasn't done anything morally wrong. The cat's just being a cat. If God doesn't exist, we should view human behavior in the same way. No action should be considered morally right or wrong. But the problem is, good and bad, right and wrong, do exist. Just as our sense experience convinces us that the physical world is objectively real, oh. our moral experience convinces us that moral values are objectively real. Every time you say, Hey, that's not fair. That's wrong. That's an injustice. You affirm your belief in the existence of objective morals. We're well aware that child abuse, racial discrimination, and terrorism are wrong for everybody, always. Is this just a personal preference or opinion? No. The man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. What all this amounts to then is a moral argument for the existence of God. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. But objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. Atheism fails to provide a foundation for the moral reality every one of us experiences every day. In fact, the existence of objective morality points us directly to the existence of God. Again, this argument can be very simply formulated. One, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Two, objective moral values and duties do exist. Three, Therefore, God exists. What makes this argument so powerful is that people generally believe both premises. In our pluralistic age, students are scared to death of imposing their values on someone else. They therefore give at least lip service to relativism. So premise one seems true to them. At the same time, however, certain values have been deeply instilled into them, such as tolerance, open-mindedness, and love. In particular, they think that it's objectively wrong to impose your values on someone else. So they're deeply committed to premise two as well. They've just never connected the dots. Perhaps the most important thing to keep in mind in sharing the moral argument is not to include, uh, confuse moral ontology with moral epistemology. Now, what do I mean by that? Moral ontology has to do with the objective reality of moral values and duties. 
moral epistemology has to do with how we come to know moral values and duties. The moral argument has nothing to do with moral epistemology. It is wholly about moral ontology, the grounding of objective moral values and duties in reality. But people inevitably confuse the two. For example, some people will think that you're claiming that in order to recognize objective moral values and duties, you have to believe in God, which is obviously false. Others will say that our moral beliefs can be explained as the result of sociobiological conditioning. Both of these objections are irrelevant to the moral argument. You're not saying that in order to recognize objective moral values and duties, you have to believe in God. And the sociobiological account at best shows how our perception of moral values and duties has evolved. But if moral values are gradually discovered rather than gradually invented, then our gradual and fallible perception of these values no more undermines their objective reality than our fallible and gradual perception of the physical world undermines its objective reality. The argument makes no claim about how we come to know objective moral values and duties, and so these sorts of epistemological objections are irrelevant. From the two premises, it follows logically that God exists. The moral argument thus complements the cosmological and design arguments by telling us about the moral nature of the creator and designer of the universe. It gives us a personal, necessarily existent being who is not only perfectly good, but whose very nature is the standard of goodness and whose commands constitute our moral duties. There are many other arguments for God's existence, and on our website, reasonablefaith.org, we have videos explaining some of these as well. As we've seen, these arguments are very simply formulated and therefore easy to memorize. Having the premises memorized will help you to keep the conversation with an unbeliever on track. If the unbeliever starts to get off track, just say patiently, well, if you think my conclusions are false, you must think that some of my premises are false. So, which premise do you reject and why? Focus on the premises. Non-believers aren't used to running into Christians who have good reasons for believing in the existence of God. So, if the unbeliever says to you, there's no evidence that God exists, you should look at him with wide eyes and open mouth and say in surprise, is that what you think? Why, I can think of at least three good arguments for God's existence. And at that point, he's got to say, yeah, like what? And then you're off and running. God is the best explanation for the origin of the universe. God is the best explanation for the fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life. God is the best explanation for the existence of objective moral values and duties in the world. If you have these arguments in your arsenal, then you will be able to share them at the drop of a hat with the unbeliever. And I found that just being able to list the arguments is often enough to satisfy the unbeliever. Now, of course, our hope is that you'll go to reasonablefaith.org and watch these videos with your unbelieving friend so that you can open a conversation with him. The arguments that we've presented here this evening constitute a powerful cumulative case for the existence of God. Together, they yield a metaphysically necessary, uncaused, transcendent, immaterial, personal creator and designer of the universe who is the paradigm and source of absolute moral goodness. We have five minutes for questions, and there are microphones in the aisles. Just line up behind them, and 
ask a question. Don't be shy. Make your way to the microphone now. Go ahead. Hey, Dr. Craig. Thank you so much for uh, the work you do. I really appreciate it, and I think you... Uh, I think you're really making a difference in the um, community as a whole. Now speak right into that mic in a nice loud voice. Okay, thank you yes. for all the work you do. Yes. Um, two you. quick questions. One open-ended, the other one more up your alley. Why, if the universe did not exist at all, is God still necessary? And then the other question is, and it's open-ended, what if we discovered aliens? None of these arguments try to prove the existence of God if the universe did not exist. To do that, you would probably need something like an ontological argument for God's existence, and we have a video on that as well. Um, but uh, given that the universe does exist, I think that we're on pretty safe grounds. Even if the universe is illusory, the illusion of the universe exists, and therefore the arguments can still go forward. And what was the second? Um, if aliens were actually discovered, it's open-ended, what, uh, what, what would the implications be biblically? What would the implications be for what? Biblically. For what? If, if aliens oh, were discovered. Nothing. I think the Bible's perfectly consistent with there being extraterrestrial life, intelligent life that God has created, and he undoubtedly has a plan for them as well. Yes, next person, please. Over here. Okay. I've heard John Lennox use the argument from rationality, the argument for God's existence from rationality. What is your take on that? Well, I haven't heard Lennox's formulation of it, but I think Alvin Plantinga gives a very, very good argument for the existence of God based upon knowledge that only the theist can give a good account of what it means to know something which will appeal to our cognitive faculties functioning properly. And the naturalist cannot give an account of what it means for our cognitive faculties to function properly because that has to do with functioning as they were designed to. And the naturalist has no such basis. So I do think there are good arguments of that sort, but those are not ones that I've worked on personally. Yes, over here. This kind of follows up the alien question. Um, so if the universe is fine-tuned for the existence of Earth, is it not fine-tuned for other planets that might have viable being. Okay, now I'm, I'm afraid with the acoustics in here, it's rather difficult for me to understand. I, I got that it's a question about aliens, but what is the question exactly? In, ref in reference to the fine-tuning yes. of Earth, I guess. Or no, no, uh, this is not about the fine-tuning of the Earth. Okay, well, This the is about universe. the fine-tuning of the entire universe. So any extraterrestrial life that exists could only exist because of this exquisite fine-tuning in the initial conditions of the Big Bang. Okay, never mind. So this is not an argument about life on Earth. And you see, that's one of the great things about this argument, is that it does an end run around this whole emotionally poisoned issue of biological evolution. What this shows is that even for evolution to occur and produce by chance, intelligent life forms, you have to have this exquisitely set table in advance in the Big Bang itself. So even before that question arises, you've already got a cosmic designer. Okay, this will have to be our last question. Hey, Dr. Craig, appreciate our work. Uh, my question is whether God's condemning sinners to hell for eternity uh, for sins committed within this life, does that make God unjust or how is he just? Is the punishment fit the crime? I have written on this question in the last chapter of my book, On Guard, about is Christ the only way? And I argue in there that um, God's punishing people forever for their rejection of his grace and his love is uh, not unjust, and there are two reasons why. 
First, even if every sin we commit deserves only a finite amount of punishment, if you commit an infinite number of sins, then you will deserve an infinite punishment. Now, nobody commits an infinite number of sins in this life, but what about in the afterlife? Insofar as the inhabitants of hell continue to hate and reject God, they continue to sin, and thus accrue to themselves more punishment. So hell is literally self-perpetuating because the sinning goes on forever, the punishment goes on forever. But the second response would be, why think that every sin is of only finite consequence and importance? I think that the sin of rejecting God is a sin of infinite gravity and proportion that plausibly therefore merits an infinite punishment. And therefore I think the just desert of those who reject God is um, eternal separation from God. Well, thank you very much for your attention this evening. I hope you'll find these videos useful in your evangelism.